Hey, my friends, it's Tom with Watchman River. Thanks for joining me today. I appreciate you guys. I hope you had a blessed weekend. Um, you know, it's I, I'll probably call this video the run up to Ramadan because, wow, we're living in a world where everything is pointing to the seven year tribulation. We're getting very, very close. And before that seven year tribulation is the rapture of the church. So we'll get into that. We'll get into some other stuff. I'll share some comments of the day and testimonies of the day and share some scripture and and we'll hang out. Okay. Uh, before I get into anything, I just got to tell you the thing I'm craving today. And I'm sorry that I got to I got to bring this up, but I have to. Uh, when I was a teenager, 19 years old, I worked at a restaurant in Hartford, Connecticut called Brown Thompson's. And it's you know, the, the Brown Thompson building is still there and there's still a restaurant, but the restaurant was called Brown Thompson's and man, they made these potato skins. I've, I've tried to, I've chased after those for 40 years and I've never had any like they were back then. They would cut the skins perfectly. They would smother them in cheddar cheese and bacon and green onions. They deep fry them at some point for a second. Then they throw them under a broiler or something. Oh man. Just never had them like that. I just, I think about those and I want them. And whenever I go somewhere and they have potato skins, I get them and they're never like those were. But, you know, that's what I'm craving. If that sounds good to you, you know, maybe find a way to make that and send it to me. <laughs> if it doesn't sound good, don't have it. It's not a recommendation. Okay. All right. Let's get to scripture. Important. Here we go. I'm opening my little book that I always tell you guys about. Uh, I don't sell these, but they're sold all over the place. God's promises for your every need. This is the New King James Version. And I am on page 175. What to do when you are waiting on God. And I love these scriptures. Here we go. Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Love it. Psalm 62, verse 5. My soul, wait silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him. I love that. You know, in these last days, what can we put our trust in but Jesus? What can you put your trust in? Nothing. Psalm 33, verse 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Amen. Isaiah 40, 31. This verse I've read so many times, and I will because it's one of my favorites. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Man, I love that scripture. Let's go to uh, Habakkuk 2, verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Man, the Lord is coming in his perfect timing and we are in the season and we're looking up every day we're not trying to figure out the day or the hour we know we've seen all the signs converge and we are just looking up and we're waiting for the rapture of the church hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful amen psalm 145 15 and 16 the eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. I love that. I love it. Let's do two more. Psalm 30, 130, Psalm 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. Amen. One more, Hebrews 3, 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Oh, man. Beautiful scripture, right? That's the way to start a video right there. Because God is good and Jesus is good. And we are in the very, very last days. Ramadan starts less. I can't believe I'm saying this, but less than a week from today. It starts on Sunday, March 10th. And the calls for violence are just growing. There are a lot of calls for violence. There are a lot of calls for violence. And I, I'm just watching this battle that's already been won. Jesus already won this battle. But in these last days, you know, my pastor's doing a series on Revelation. And he calls it Clash, clash of the Kingdoms. And it's it really is a clash of the kingdoms. But we know who wins. 
but we're in these very last days. And I'm looking at this Ramadan. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to read you a few headlines here. This is from Israel Today from Telegram. He said, ahead of Ramadan, which begins on March 10th, Palestinian social media is full of incitement to violence against Israel and the Jews. I've seen videos that are incredible. They're, they're openly just calling for violence. Hamas and its terrorist partners want to see an escalation of the war against Israel during Ramadan, believing that the religious fervor that usually accompanies the holy month will inspire more Muslims to join the battle. Ramadan this year is going to be far more tense than usual, and many are expecting a major explosion. And you know, this is just, we're living in a time period. It's just, it's incredible. When you look at everything that's going on, and, and I never say, you know, never pin your hopes on one thing. Look at everything that's going on collectively. Look at all the signs that have converged. Because if you just pick one from another, if you just looked at one, you know, there's always been earthquakes. Well, there's always been this or that. It's all of them together converging. The end of Ramadan coincides with the date of the Great American Eclipse. I don't know what that means, but it's fascinating. April 8th-ish. And that's when the a Great American Eclipse is that forms that final line of the X over the United States. This is from Israel Today. Less than a week to go until Ramadan, and there is intense debate within Israel regarding Muslim prayers atop Jerusalem's Temple Mount. Internal Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir wants to severely restrict Muslim access to the holy site during Ramadan, both as a punishment for October 7th and to prevent further mass incitement. Shin Bet director Ronan Barr remains committed to the old concept of thinking and insists that restricting Muslims during their holy time will only further inflame passions and lead to an anger explosion. They're kind of in a, you know, they're in a lose-lose situation. I just don't, I don't know what's going to happen there, but it's, it's hard to plan on how you want that whole thing to go. <laughs> because, Barring people from going there, yeah, that could incite some violence. And letting them all go there, you know, there's always violence there every every Ramadan. But this one's like, we're really keeping our eye on this. This is from the Jerusalem Post. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad spokesman calls for continuation of Battle of al Flood. Abu Hamza, the spokesman for Al-Quds Battalion of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, said in his speech on Saturday that he is declaring the continuation of the Battle of al Flood, as they call the war. The call to continue the war was made on the basis of unity between the arenas in Gaza, Lebanon, Iraq, and Yemen. He also said, I will call upon our people in the West Bank and Holy Jerusalem to go out and attack the enemy. I call upon the Arab and Islamic nations to make the first day of Ramadan an international day of support for Gaza. Just, and this is his final quote, incredible, but just as you turn to God in prayer and fasting, turn to the land of Israel with weapons, he added. It's like, whoa, dude, it's quite a religion you got there. I, I'll, I'll just have water over that religion, but thank you. This is from Israel today. Hamas chief Sinwar refuses to provide Israel with a list of names of the living Israeli hostages, as was initially promised to Israel by third-party mediators. Israel believes that Sinwar wants to spark unrest across the region during Ramadan next week. We're in these very last days. It's going to be an amazing thing to watch what goes on. You know, and maybe nothing will go on, but I can't imagine. I can't imagine. We'll see. You know, pray for the people, all the people over there. This is from the Jerusalem Post. Palestinian Islamic Jihad calls for Ramadan to be a month of terror. These are all from the last day or two. This is from yesterday. Palestinian Islamic Jihad is calling for Ramadan to be a month of terror and seeks to escalate attacks in the West Bank and Gaza. In a recent speech, Abu Hamza, the spokesman for PIJ's Al-Quds Brigade, said he wants Arab countries in the region and pro-Iranian groups to continue to unify various arenas and fronts against Israel. This is the latest indication that terrorist groups plan to seek an escalation in hostilities over the next month. Uh, Hamza's remarks were published by the Beirut-based al Mayuddin news channel, which is pro-Iranian and frequently highlights Hamas and Hezbollah attacks. 
Palestinian Islamic Jihad is a proxy of Iran. It has armed men in Gaza and the West Bank, and its leaders often reside in, drumroll, Damascus, where they sometimes leave to meet with their Iranian handlers and Tehran or to coordinate with Hamas and Hezbollah. So just we're going to keep our eyes on this because, man, from all appearances, we are in the very last days. I really believe, I've said this since October 7th, I think this war in Israel leads to the rapture. And I think this year's Ramadan might be crazy. You know, might be crazy. We're waiting for God to enter into this war, because I think he does, via Psalm 83. I think he's going to enter in, and he's going to get rid of the inner ring of enemies within Israel. But I believe the rapture probably happens as that happens, or right before that's why I keep saying, I, th I really think we're, we're there. We're waiting. We're there. Um, the Lord is, the Lord is so patient. He always warns though, doesn't he? He always warns. There's always signs. He's such a compassionate and, and patient God that we serve. All right. What else is going on? This is, um, from the Jerusalem post. Israel said to boycott Cairo ceasefire talks over the hostage list. Uh, Israel boycotted the Gaza ceasefire talks in Cairo yesterday after Hamas rejected its demand for a complete list naming hostages that are still alive, according to reports. A Hamas delegation arrived in Cairo for the talks, billed as a possible final hurdle before an agreement that would halt the fighting for six weeks and allow for the release of additional hostages out of the remaining 134 captives in Gaza. By the evening, there was no de there was no sign of a delegation from Israel, which had said that it would only send officials to the talks if it received a list of the captives to be freed and a second list of security prisoners and terrorists held in its jails, which Hamas would want to see freed in exchange. And of course, Hamas, you know, Hamas, this is from Israel today. Hamas reiterates that there will be no hostage deal unless... Israel agrees to end the war in Gaza. Hezbollah says it will not stop attacking northern Israel until the war in Gaza ends. Both groups want to conclude this round of fighting, having dictated the terms to Israel, i.e. victory. Both groups want to be able to say when the fighting begins, as they did on October 7th, and when it ends. Yeah, they treat it like they're, they treat it like they're winning. You know, Israel must stop playing this game and instead go for total victory. And the world needs to let Israel do this. Anything less only guarantees the next round of violence. Those who claim to want long term peace should support an Israeli victory. So there you go. You know, Hamas won't turn over this list. It's total chaos in the Middle East as we await our king. We're about to be face to face with Jesus. That's why I always say, when you hear all this news, don't get rattled because Jesus isn't rattled. He's not nervous. Just cling to Jesus in these times. We're in dark times because we're in the very last days. They're dark. They're going to get darker leading up to the day of the rapture. I truly believe that. What else? Here we got from the Jerusalem Post, Nasrallah's grandson killed by the IDF in a Lebanon attack over the weekend. The grandson of Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah, his name is Abbas Ahmad Halil, was one of the three Hezbollah terrorists killed on Saturday by the IDF in a strike in Nakora in South Lebanon, according to a report by the Syrian radio channel Voice of the Capital on Sunday. So the leader of Hezbollah lost his grandson in the attack. I hate war, man. I hate war. Jesus, come and bring peace. But you know what? There's seven-year period that's coming that's going to be so horrific. Get us out of here, Lord. What else? The IAEA chief. Listen to this. That's the that's the International Atomic Energy Agency. We have lost track of Iran's nuke progress. Really? <laughs> Doesn't seem like that's a that big of a problem. The IAEA chief Rafael Grassi said on Monday. He told the IAEA Board of Governors that the agency has lost continuity of knowledge in relation to the production inventory of centrifuges, rotors, bellows, heavy water, and uranium ore concentrate. Oopsie, it's gone. 
<laughs> it is three years since Iran stopped provisionally applying its additional protocol, and therefore it is also three years since the agency was able to conduct complementary access in Iran, Grassi said, des describing large gaps in nuclear inspections. So does that surprise anyone that they've lost track of Iran's nuke progress? <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. What else? That British-owned bulk carrier that was hit with a with a missile in uh, in the Red Sea has sunk. Says the British-owned bulk carrier Ruby Mar has tragically sunk after being struck by a Houthi anti-ship missile two weeks ago, marking the first ship to be claimed by the Houthis. Carrying over. Listen to this, please. Listen to this and remember how we all have to adjust our lives because of global warming, climate change. Carrying over 41,000 tons of fertilizer, its sinking now poses a severe threat to the marine environment, a looming ecological disaster of unprecedented scale. I haven't heard one word in the mainstream media about how this has affected the environment. I haven't heard one word because they don't care. They only care when it's telling us we're not going to eat meat and we're not going to breathe and we're not going to live and we all have to make all these sacrifices for the environment but something major happens there's just crickets you don't hear one word about it because they don't care about the environment nor have they ever it's all politics it's all a show what else these deadly texas wildfires they've now scorched over a million acres killed thousands of livestock and have destroyed crops they're saying the deadly Texas wildfires have scorched over a million acres, killed thousands of livestock and destroyed crops. Ranches have burned, highways are shut down, and thousands have been evacuated. And as of this past weekend, yesterday, Saturday, the fire is only 15% contained. Pray for the people. Pray for our brothers and sisters in that area. My goodness. What else? There was a strong earthquake yesterday. 6.7 hits the Macquarie Island region between New Zealand and Australia. Pretty wild. Last 48 hours, 72 earthquakes over 4.0, eight of which were over 5.0, and one over 6.0. So there you go. All right, this, Hollywood's worried about this AI problem. And... You know, I wish it was just Hollywood that it was affecting, but I really believe artificial intelligence is a big part of the beast system that the AC is going to use during the seven-year tribulation. Artificial intelligence is getting more and more artificially intelligent. And this article here is talking about One Life Director predicts AI-generated shows are inevitable. Uh, his name is Director James Hawes. And he's concerned about the long-term impacts of artificial intelligence in entertainment. Hawes testified in the House of Commons as part of its inquiry committee on British film and high-end television, explaining he spoke with the legal team that represented SAG and the WGA last summer about how long it would be before a show could be AI-generated. The best guess is that in between three and five years' time, they said, somebody will be able to say... Create me a scene in an ER room where a doctor comes in and he's having an affair with a woman, so they're flirting and somebody's dying on the table, and it will start to create it, he said. He also expressed concern over the release of OpenIA's text-to-video model, Sora, we talked about this last week, which included several examples of AI-generated videos. The expert I was talking to said to me, I thought this might happen in 18 months to two years, and suddenly it's here. Again, it is text generative. So somebody just types or speaks into a machine. Give me a scene of a woman in Tokyo walking along a rainy street, and it produces it, Hawes said. It's not library footage assembled. It is digitally produced. It is not live action perfect, but it's pretty darn close. The television director with credits like Penny Dreadful and Snowpiercer, never heard of him, uh, to his name, noted human creativity is still vital to the process. But see, I, I look at this and I, I just see the dangers that this can do in every area of life. Because if you can speak 
to this AI and say, create me a scene of a woman walking through a Tokyo rainy night and it makes it, then they can say, give me a scene of Tom saying that the rapture isn't here and we're not close to the rapture and the seven year tribulation is 50 years away and it'll create it. You know, it's like lies and deception ramp up. Give me a video of this certain person committing this crime. And I mean, then it'll be, is it live or is it Memorex? Like it's going to be, is it, what, did this really happen or is it AI? It's just more lies and deception ramping up as we head into these final, final days. Lord Jesus, come get us. We're ready. We're ready. All right. How about we do a couple testimonies of the day and then we'll get to some comments. Okay. Kathleen. October 18th, 2022, I listened to a woman's testimony and I suddenly truly believed in Jesus. In that moment, something supernatural happened. I was healed of 20 plus years of anxiety, heart palpitations all day long and benzo dependence. I haven't had to touch it once since. I believed and was given the Holy Spirit in the blink of an eye and was given what felt like an actual new heart. I've never felt such peace. I was baptized on Easter. My hubby soon after. My children are being brought up in Christ. Praise God. Beautiful. Thank you, Kathleen, for sharing that. Thank you. Marcus. It's amazing how God works in our lives way before we are even aware of it. I was adopted from a very bad family along with my twin sister before the age of one. I grew up in a life of crime drug and various other addictions and homelessness. I remember laying in bed crying out to God, why do I have no family and no prospect in life? I desired a family and love. God answered me with his love and answered my prayers with a wife, a home and a baby boy. I was overjoyed first time father until the day we lost our boy at 37 weeks. Heartbroken, I came to the Lord and my words were simply, I don't put any blame on you, God. I knew God was looking after my precious child. A year later, God blessed me with twin girls. They're now nine, they're now nine years old. And every day I praise my God for his love and mercy. It's easy to get despondent with life, but you have to trust in God regardless of the circumstance. God never left me, never gave up on me, and always protected me even if I didn't see it at the time. How could God love such a wretched sinner like me? I still today have no clue, but I am so thankful he does. Wow. Thank you, Marcus. Wow. It's powerful. It's powerful. Comments of the day. Gene, I'm pushing 74 years old this month. My parents suffered World War II, and I always assumed that the world would have learned the hard lesson. It seems humans never learn and are doomed to keep repeating ugly stuff. Never have I seen such evil and hatred in this world. May God have mercy. Yeah, we're in the last days, Gene. We're in the last days. Yeah, you'd think, you know, World War II wasn't all that long ago. You know, and everybody always says those famous words whenever tragedies happen, wars or events, they say, oh, we'll never forget. And it just repeats again and again, this cycle, because Satan, you know. But God. But God. Heather. Number one warning sign that the rapture is near, in my opinion, is the convergence of all the signs Jesus told us about. Amen. My faith is strengthened every day. Praise God. I love and trust you fully, my precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maranatha. Amen, Heather. Yeah, it's the convergence. Because I always say, you could, if you pick apart one sign from another, it's always, well, this has always happened. This has always happened. But when you look at everything that's happening... We're there. We're waiting. We're there. Sparkle. Considering back in the day, I always kept my little house clean and tidy. Made sure I could serve tea or coffee and maybe with a cake or pie. Made sure because I knew I would feel disappointed if I couldn't properly provide for my visitors. I'm going on 80 years old now and I look around at the world and feel ashamed and disappointed. I'm expecting a visitor soon. His name is Jesus. I'm tidying up. I want everything perfect for his return. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Cade. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, 2. This verse melts my heart, knowing that our king was joyful, knowing he would have to shed his precious blood for the whole world. I believe he saw the billions of people who were going to be set free and live in liberty through his sacrifice in future generations. Just amazing. You're right, Kay. That is amazing. It is amazing. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He sees something in us that, you know, I, I can't see it. <laughs> I can't see it, but Jesus loved us so much that he came here to die a criminal's death. He came here to experience the most brutalized, horrendous death because he loves us. And we're, we're sinners. And, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So Jesus comes here and he, he puts on human flesh and he lives this completely perfect life knowing the whole time he was going to end up on the cross knowing he was here the lamb of god to shed blood to cover our sins to, to erase our sins with the power of his blood because once you believe in the power of jesus blood and understand it will wash you white as snow once you believe in that it will wash you white as snow it will remove all your sins from you as far as the east is from the west that's the kind of god we serve and I always tell you because it amazes me that the same Jesus who spoke and put the moon and the sun and the stars in the sky is the same Jesus who came here to put on human flesh to die that horrendous death because he loves us so much. Because he has a plan for us for eternity that we can't fathom. It's a beautiful plan. We're going to be in a place with no pain, no tears no suffering, and it will never end. And we will praise his name forever and ever. It's like, I hear that. It's like, where do I sign? Give me the dotted line, man. Give me a pen. It's believing in the precious blood of Jesus that he shed and believing in his finished work, that he went to the cross, he died, they put him in the tomb, and on the third day, he rose again. And when you believe that, you are saved, you are rapture ready, you are sealed, until the day of redemption. He'll never let you out of the palm of his hand. It's the greatest event that's ever happened that Jesus came here to pay for our sins with his blood. But yet, wide is the path to destruction. So many, many will hear this message and say, I don't need that. I don't want that. That's not for me. There's, there's many other paths to heaven. It's like, no, there's not. Of all the major religious figures, Jesus is the only one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. He's the only one. Muhammad never said that. They gave him, they, uh, they gave him importance hundreds of years after his death. He just said, I, have, I had visions from there their God, whatever, Allah. He never said he was God. Confucius never said he was God. Buddha never said he was God. When they asked Buddha about the afterlife, he said, I can't figure out the things of earth and you're asking me about the afterlife. All he did was he taught them how to meditate to get to this stage of nirvana. They called it the that, which is beyond all that. But he never, they took them 500 years to say he was godlike. No, Jesus is the way to heaven. The only way, the only truth. The only way. There's nothing else coming along. So if you reject the message of the good news that you're saved by grace and unearned gift from God through faith in Christ Jesus, if you reject that message and say, it's not for me, just let me live my life, you will face Jesus one day on judgment day. And my goodness, you're going to realize like he paid for my sins with his blood, but I rejected the payment. Now I'm kneeling before him He's looking me right in the eye and he's saying, away from me, I never knew you because I rejected the payment. Horrifying, terrifying, the most terrifying moment of your existence. But again, 
If I lined up a hundred people that didn't know any of this, maybe five would come to Jesus and 95 would say, I don't need that. I don't know. I don't know the percentage I'm guessing, but I know that wide is the path to destruction. So make the right choice. This is the most important decision of your life. It's more important than any other decision you will ever face in life. Will you say, yes, I believe in the one who paid for my sins with his blood? Or are you going to say, nah, I'll roll the dice with eternity. I'm okay. I'm more good than bad. You won't be sent to hell because you're good. You will be sent because you didn't take the payment for your sins. You didn't say, yes, Jesus, wash me white as snow. I believe in the power of your blood. And I believe in your finished work. But today is a day of salvation. Today. So I hope you choose wisely. I really do. Anyway, I'm going to shut the camera off now. And I'm going to say a prayer for every person who watched this video. And if we're not raptured today, and you know what, guys? Today is a perfectly good day for the rapture. But if we're not, God willing... I will see you guys tomorrow. I love you guys.